minutes for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's good to see you. Dr. Roberts, I'd like to start with you. Could you explain something to us uh, just uh, in, in a minute or so called Simpson's Paradox? Only a minute? Could I? You, you, mean, have, like, a great you have a great tweet. video online that, that does it so in Simps a couple minutes. Simpson's Paradox yeah. is the phenomenon that composition changes can affect how people in trends uh, are measured over time. So just to take an example, you can have uh, it's a study done of poverty rates from, I think, uh, late 1960s to early 2000s. Great. Every type of family had a dramatic drop of at least 20 percent in the poverty rate, except for one group, which was 10 percent. That group was very small. That was, I think, single men without children. But women with children, their poverty rate fell by more than 20 percent. Married couples, their poverty rate fell by more than 20 percent. So when you look across all six groups, you'd think that the average poverty rate should have dropped by about 20-something percent. Some were 29 percent drop. It's a huge decrease, wonderfully, in the poverty rate among single women with children. But the poverty rate barely budged. Uh, and how could that be? Shouldn't it be a weighted average of the different groups? And the answer is it's not because the proportions of the groups change. And over that time period, we got an enormous increase, almost a doubling, in the group with the highest poverty rate, which was single women with children. So as a result, the measured poverty rate didn't change. So the question is, when you're looking at how growth affects poverty, you probably want to take into account the fact that at the same time, demography, the demographic structure of the United States was changing, and you wouldn't want to say the economic growth over that time period had no effect on poverty if at the same time there was something else going on. How okay. do do? So they, they, they don't all weigh the same, and they, and they shake down differently. I, and the weights change over time. And I, I've got a graph in front of you that, that I think um, tends to show some of this. So, Simpson's paradox. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so between 1969 and 2016, according to, uh, as this chart indicates, median household income rose by 37%. But the increase would have been much larger uh, if there had not been significant changes in family formation, family structure, and family dissolution. Uh, and uh, among households that are headed by married parents, median income nearly doubled. And among households headed by single mothers, it rose by more than 60 percent. Um, and, and yet, you see that the median household income rose by 37 percent, which is significantly lower than this um, uh, lowest performing cohort that I described. So would you say this is a, an example of Simpson's paradox being played out? It is, and it's an example of how challenging it is to assess the effect of the economy on different groups when, those pro when other things are happening in the background. It's really a lesson in the complexity of economics and how often uh, Mark Twain was right, because sometimes it's very hard to know what statistics are actually measuring. And as uh, the studies done by my social capital project have shown, um, families today are twice as likely to be headed by a single parent uh, as they were at the end of the 60s. So um, I, I'd like to ask you, is there, is there anything that we can look to in terms of federal policy that might either, either be uh, pushing this trend or that could alleviate it, that could improve it? In other words, people tend to perform better if uh, they have two parent households. Uh, what federal policies, if any, can you think of that might help that? Well, I'll leave my other uh, panelists to respond more to that, but I would simply say that I don't think we fully understand the causal relationship between family structure and income. Um, I don't think the federal government should be necessarily in the business of particularly trying to design the American uh, family, but they should get rid of any barriers that make it expensive to be married. I would certainly agree with that. No, oh, sure. And, and I agree with you on both points. It's not the federal government's business to coerce, cajole, uh, 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 or, or lead people into any particular family structure. If, on the other hand, it's doing something to actively discourage people from getting married, if it is punishing them for, uh, from doing so, for doing so, that could be a problem. And it could be a problem that leads to less favorable economic outcomes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moore, in the time I have left, uh, would you have anything to add in terms of federal policy that might be affecting this? You mean with respect to? Uh, Family formation, uh, dissolution. Welfare policy. I mean, you really have to look at whether our welfare policies are encouraging out of wedlock births and, and, and whether it's leading to higher uh, divorce rates, and, and there is some evidence that it is. So we, we ought to have policies on welfare that encourage work and discourage um, non-marriage. Okay. 
Uh, uh, thank you very much. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman.